Players love to blame other factors for their poor performance. Usually, these are bad excuses for miserable form. But every now and then, they have a point. Perhaps the best-known case of a change tripping players up was the failed introduction of the new ball, made of a microfiber composite. While baseball is known for its traditionalism and its slow, deliberate change, the NBA has never been shy about changing the game and innovating. In 2006, sports equipment giant Spalding shifted its focus from producing leather balls to synthetic ones. They noted several advantages over traditional leather items. First, while old school balls must be broken in, their synthetic equivalents come ready. Animal rights activists would be happy that you no longer have to slaughter Betsy the cow in order to have a game of pickup. But most importantly, from Spalding's perspective, they are much cheaper to produce. The company had already overseen the switch among high school and college teams across the country. Dan Toey, a former VP at the company, remembers. We had been talking to the NBA for a while about how 100% of high schools and colleges in the country had already switched over to microfiber composite basketball. And we asked, isn't it time to take the league to the next generation of technology in basketball? The NBA was easy to convince, since, by all metrics, the microfiber ball appeared to represent the future of the game. So, Spalding presented its new ball to the league. A cross-traction microfiber ball replaced the classic eight-panel leather sphere with an interlocking cross-panel design. So, Spalding and the league pulled out all the stops for the introduction of this innovation. The press statement emphasized that this was the first change to the ball in over 35 years and only the second in 60 seasons. On June 28, 2006, they launched the microfiber ball at the New York NBA store. League Commissioner David Stern led the proceedings. Meanwhile, Paul Pierce of the Boston Celtics represented the players, and Kenny Smith from inside the NBA stood as the resident journalist. The future was here. Or so Spalding and the NBA thought. Stern made a statement he would live to regret, saying, The advancements that Spalding made to the new game ball ensure that the best basketball players in the world will be playing with the best basketball in the world. Meanwhile, Spalding's CEO, Scott Creelman, said, Spalding's continual efforts to advance basketball technology have yielded the optimal ball. Few players would agree. The league immediately sent the new microfiber composite ball to players around the league so they can get used to it before the 2006-2007 season started on October 31st. For many, the feel of the thing is an immediate turnoff. As the season grew closer, it became apparent that most players were not fans of the new ball. Stars were not shy about their distaste for the microfiber feel. Shaquille O'Neal said, I think the new ball is terrible. It's the worst decision some expert, whoever did it, made. The NBA's been around for how long? A hundred years? Fifty years? So, to change it now, whoever that person is needs to have his college degree revoked. It's a terrible decision. He later added, Whoever did this needs to be fired. It was terrible. A terrible decision. Awful. Tell us how you really feel, Shaq. Don't sugarcoat it. Finding players who didn't hate the ball with a passion is tricky. Karan Butler of the Washington Wizards said, I don't know what the big deal is. About as warm an endorsement as this ball got from the guys who actually had to play with it. The 2006-07 NBA season gets off to a bad start. At this point, Stern and the gang could be excused for thinking it would take the players some time to adjust and everything would be fine. But the issue would continue to dog the NBA throughout the first half of the season. It turned out that aside from an unpleasant synthetic feel, the ball was causing physical problems for the players. Shooters had a particularly tough time with the new feel since it stuck to their fingers, breaking the clean release. Eddie Curry of the Knicks said, the ball never leaves the hand the same way. It sticks to my middle finger. It bounces differently off the dribble and on the shot. Ray Allen, who had just set the record for three-pointers in a season, complained. 
I have to constantly put lotion all over my hands because my fingers are cracking and is causing splits on my fingertips. And they weren't just complaining. Several players showed reporters cuts, bruises, and split fingernails. But that wasn't the only complaint the players had. Some other issues that came up included the ball sticking far too often between the rim and the backboard. The new ball also absorbed less moisture than its old-school leather ball counterpart. This is, of course, a severe problem. Balls must absorb a lot of sweat and other moisture over a game. Finally, the complaints were too much for Stern and the NBA brass. The NBA commissioner said, If our players are unhappy with it, we have to analyze to the nth degree the cause of their unhappiness. Everything is on the table. I'm not pleased, but I'm realistic. We've got to do the right thing here. And of course, the right thing is to listen to our players. It is easy to criticize a process in retrospect, and I'm sure that introducing the new ball seemed like a good idea at the time. But there are some clear issues with the NBA, and Spalding ran the process. Only three players tested the ball before the decision was made. The trio was Mark Jackson, Reggie Miller, and Steve Kerr. So, not much of a sample. Worse yet, the test just involved an hour of leisurely practice at Madison Square Garden. Jackson remembers that there were no outstanding problems in that hour. When I played, it didn't matter, he said last night. If it was round, let's get it on. But in retrospect, the process was simply inadequate. The league did the absolute minimum to gain the consent of the players. Jerry Stackhouse, the talented guard who worked as the players' union representative, gave a pretty fair assessment of the problem. As players, we're going to adjust. It's not like the game has lost anything, the scoring is down, or we're not getting exciting finishes. The game's not been affected in that way. So, what was the problem? The lack of sufficient consultation with the players. Jerry said, but it is one of those things where it is directly affecting our workplace. Unilateral, that's the word. Stackhouse summarized, when it comes to the actual game itself, and when it comes to in between the lines, we should definitely have some input. The writing was on the wall when on December 1st, 2006, the Players' Union filed two unfair labor practice charges with the National Labor Relations Board. With all that criticism, the new ball did not last long in the NBA. The season started in October 2006, and by January 1st, Stern had given up on it. In late December, the league released a memo stating, Our players' response to this particular composite ball has been overwhelmingly negative, and we are acting accordingly. Although testing performed by Spalding and the NBA demonstrated that the new composite ball was more consistent than leather. Statistically, there has been an improvement in shooting, scoring, and ball-related turnovers. The most important statistic is the view of our players. If you read between the lines on this statement, the league and Spalding did not admit they were wrong. Instead, Stern essentially said that the new ball was better, but they would let the players have what they wanted. So, while the willingness to change back is admirable, no proper accountability was taken here. Superstar LeBron James was delighted. He said, for the league to succeed, the players must be happy. Basketball is the most important thing to us. Like I said before, you can change the dress code, you can make our shorts shorter, but when you take our basketball away from us, that's not a transition we handle. But not every player was happy with the switch back. Phoenix Suns star Steve Nash said, After playing with an authentic leather ball your whole life and going to a composite was very difficult. But after playing with it every day, you become used to it, Nash said. It's going to be another arduous time for us to adjust back. While that may sound like players are complaining no matter what the NBA does, it's easy to understand where Nash is coming from. Players just want stability. Being a successful player at this high level is difficult enough without having to get used to a different ball every few months. Ball problems continue to bedevil the NBA. In 2007, the NBA ball went back to the traditional Spalding model. 
and we would like to say that the league lived happily ever after. But the NBA did not learn as much as it could have from that debacle. In 2021, the NBA allowed its contract with Spalding to lapse. Instead, they went back to working with Wilson, a company that had made their balls before Spalding began their 37-year run in 1983. Hardly any players in the league had even been born the last time the NBA had a Wilson ball. On the face of it, Wilson did better than Spalding in the NBA had in 2006. The company used the same Chicago tannery as its predecessors had. Wilson also said it made special efforts to break in the balls before sending them to the NBA teams. Once they did so, they asked players for their responses to the new balls. Furthermore, the new balls were used in the NBA draft combine and throughout the summer leagues. But still, there were many complaints from players. Early in the season, the percentages for free throws and three-pointers dropped to historically low levels. Paul George blamed the new ball, saying, It's a different basketball. It doesn't have the same touch and softness that the Spalding ball had. Players absolutely do not want their feel and routine tampered with. Hopefully, the league will keep these changes to a minimum. Whatever happened to that bit of wisdom telling us, if it ain't broke, don't fix it.